Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Cup, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your host, uh, marketing manager, Mackenzie, and today we are going to be talking about the Tim Carroll 2014 production of King John, which has become one of Shakespeare's least performed historical plays. This week, we have a great uh, panel with us. Uh, first off, we have our artistic director of Cup of Hemlock, uh, Mr. William Bartley. Will, how are you? I'm doing well today, Mac. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. What is in your cup today? Uh, I am drinking Queen Mary black tea. Great choice, very royal. Thank you very Perfect. much. <laughs> Next, we have our resident dramaturg and literary manager, Ryan Brockovich. Hello, thanks for having me back. <laughs> yes. Wonderful, and what is in your cup today? So, uh, as always, I just have regular boring old orange Pico tea, but I do have an interesting mug this time. Ooh. So, why don't I talk about that? So, uh, yes. just like a little, I guess, personal backstory a bit. Uh, my grandmother uh, recently moved in with my family due to COVID and the retirement home being a bad place to be right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just finally got the go ahead this week to move all of her stuff out of the building because it was under lockdown and bring it all here. And one little treasure that was found in there is this mug. I don't know if you can really see it. It's very faded from years of washing of a photo. Of, that's my grandparents and that's my brother who's in his 30s now as a tiny, tiny baby. Um, but yeah, so I just thought in honor of young Arthur and his granddam, I thought this would be an appropriate choice to, to drink very, from very on this occasion. Very deep, wonderful pull. I love that. I love that. That. And most certainly, last but not least, we have a great new face to the panel, Miss Claire Martin. Hello, Claire. Hey, Mackenzie. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us today. It's a true treat. Now, you are uh, acquainted with Will because both of you appeared on another Shakespeare uh, kind of roundtable discussion together with fellow artistic directors. So, Claire, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself just so people can kind of get to know you? Of course, yeah. I'm the Assistant Artistic Director of Sweet Tea Shakespeare, which is um, a small little repertory company in North Carolina. Um, mm. I was hired just as COVID was unfolding, and so um, I should actually live in Raleigh, North Carolina, but instead I still live on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, um, and I'm just waiting until uh, it becomes safe to travel, and then I will move out and meet in person all of the people that I've been working remotely for. Great, that's wonderful. I love that. And what is in your cup today? I'm severely dehydrated, so I'm drinking red Gatorade from a plastic cup. Neither of them are very royal, so I don't know how this connects to <laughs> Except that I guess maybe it looks like blood, so. There you go, very good, very good. And my cup today is my lovely goblet from medieval times where I work when I'm not in COVID lockdown, because this play is very medieval. It's all set around that 11th century Magna Carta E era of history. So I thought, perfect. And I am drinking some water today. 13th century. Yeah. <laughs> Medieval times a little bit earlier in the histories than at 11th century. So give or take a few centuries. Close cool. enough. Either way, there we go. I, I like so, that all three of us were just like, wait. That's, it's like the only there. interesting thing about that entire century is the Magna Carta. <laughs> if you're on a trivia show and they say that it begins with a 12, you could just buzz in right away because that's going to be the answer. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it was it's 12, what is it, 1275 is the Magna Carta? Mm. I think is when it was signed. Yeah, sorry, 1215. 1215. Yeah. June 12th yeah. on 1215. It's... <laughs> Otherwise, it's a boring century, so it starts with a 12, doesn't make a difference one. <laughs> really says something, too, that the most interesting thing happened near the start of that century. <laughs> yeah, but Shakespeare didn't find it all that interesting because he didn't bother to include it in his play about King John. <laughs> the one big thing about King John is left entirely out of the play. You would think yeah. that would be like a great centerpiece of this particular play, but We no. don't got time for that. We've got babies to kill. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But here we go. So why don't we got, kind of dive right into this uh, show. So once again, King John directed by Tim Carroll. It was uh, performed on the old Tom Patterson uh, theater stage, which is our second time we're seeing this stage because the last time was in Time in of Athens. And we'll see it again in our next episode as well for the Avengers of Pericles. So we will see this stage for the next few weeks. Uh, but yeah, it, once again, it came out in 2014. And it starred a great cast, including Graham Abbey, Tom McManus, Patricia Collins, and Shauna McKenna. 
So why don't we dive right in? And Claire, why don't you start with us? Who was like just like who do you feel was the best performed uh, character or, or 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 part of the show? This was actually the hard, possibly the hardest question for me because um, I wanted to answer personally, and I think I should answer professionally. So my from a from a professional standpoint, if I'm thinking as an assistant artistic director, as a theater director, um, I found uh, Tom McCamus's product, uh, performance of King John to just be wonderful and idiosyncratic and just profoundly deeply felt. Um, he seemed to have a real understanding of the character, an authentic connection to him. Um, he really like fluidly blended King John's kind of stunted maturity with his arrogance, with his social awkwardness, but it never came across as, um, as a parody or, a, mm -hmm. um, or something that was like overinflated. And I really mm -hmm. appreciated that. Mm -hmm. um, however, the character that I cared about, the character that I got excited about every time she came on, was Shana McKenna's mm -hmm. Constance, who commanded the That's stage on my list. as powerfully, intelligently, mm -hmm. and defiantly as I sort of hoped. Um, so that mm -hmm. was my personal thing. Love that. Wonderful. <laughs> well said. I mean, Constance was on my list as well. Mine too, uh, but I have backups. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it was a tie because they both are very similar characters, which was Patricia Collins as Queen Eleanor and Shauna McKenna as Constance. And I thought they were very much oh, playing the same. Foils. They're, they're <laughs> foils to each other. And what I liked is that, once again, it showed, especially in this medieval age, and we see this with uh, Richard and, and, and a lot of the other history plays, where it's the women of, the, of these stories that are really kind of puppet mastering a lot of the inner political workings that go on on this stage. So with like the two of them going at it with each other, trying to get their kind of uh, chosen king up to power, and you kind of see them kind of working their magic behind behind the scenes. You see them both vying for this spot, and yet at the same time, they play it very quietly, quietly. And they're where both unceremoniously killed off stage right they after are. Act Three. <laughs> they are. They're killed. They're both killed <laughs> off, and, and the fact that like everything goes to crap after they die. Which is like totally great because once again, it, sh it, it just shows. Yeah. Mm. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, just the two the two actresses alone were just electrifying to watch together. I mean, I mean, during that whole a um, uh, 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 grand dam scene where it's Arthur's in the middle between the two of them, and they're both kind of warring over him, and they're al almost like uh, vultures, like circling this carcass body on stage, and they're both in these kind of black plumed. Uh, puffed up dresses that kind of just make them kind of just seem like these. Well, Constance was in black. Eleanor was in red the whole time. Sorry, which, sorry. Yeah, Eleanor the red was and red. the black was a great contrast visually exactly. on stage. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I yeah, know it's wonderful. So yes, the two mm -hmm. of them were my two. Just also special shout out to Bridget Wilson, who, mm -hmm. who was friend of the show, yeah. friend of the show, who was a terrific body double as Dead Arthur. Mm -hmm. Oh, she oh, played that, Dead Arthur too. <laughs> well, yeah, she she yeah, also she, played Lady Falconbridge, who's in one scene, did. like a yeah. not a huge part. But I didn't realize that that was her as the the Dead carcass Arthur. there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, yes. She was the carcass of Arthur. Mm -hmm. I thought in general, killed it. the women just commanded this play. Mm -hmm. and they did. That, like, I really felt that this was a wonderful um, presentation of the character of King John. Mm -hmm. I like. I feel like the women actually. Like ruled the production. Like they yeah, were absolutely. And like I want to do a quick shout out um, for um, Jennifer Mombach. I yeah, think, Blanche of Castile. Yeah. A totally thankless role in this play, Captain Massage in this role, and mm -hmm. she just endowed Blanche with so much like grace and wisdom and agency. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I was sitting here watching her, and I was like, God bless your soul <laughs> for just, like, going out that thankless character with, um, <laughs> with just like this like luminous confidence. I mm -hmm. loved it. It was yes. definitely like one of my favorite elements of the play for sure was just that how the, all the women in the play represented the consciousness of humanity as were all the other male characters were just doing. They were always doing, making decisions right <laughs> in the moment. There was like one moment of introspection between the two kings where King of France is obviously like, oh, should I make this deal? Should I not? But even then, like the women like uh, on either side of them too, kind of representing that duality mm -hmm. of thought, like <laughs> it, what potent imagery was staged between the those elements, like uh, definitely the way I agree. Like, kind I of think presence within the even piece. my favorite single moment in this entire production was Blanche of Castile when she has to choose a side and all the men simultaneously yeah. put up a hand and she has that like beautiful monologue that's on the page is so understated but the way she performed it really just brought it to life in such a wonderful way. Mm -hmm. I was sold. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Will, how about you? Who is your shout out uh, 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 of the cast? It, you know, it's a bit of a personal one because like uh, one of my big uh, points of contention when I see a lot of Shakespeare productions is the unwillingness to interact with the audience and incorporate mm -hmm. them into the performance and really draw them into the piece. I and that's why you're going Graham Abbey for me, like absolutely <laughs> just blew it out of the park because like, mm -hmm. First of all, his portrayal of Falconbridge in general, I found like was very fun in the first act. And then mm -hmm. we started to get into some of like the darker, more uh, deepening elements of the character within the second and third and, and so on and so forth. Uh, like mm -hmm. it just felt like a rounded out character that was developed through the entire piece. But my favorite part of it all was uh, like just the way that he interacted with the audience and, and like just tossing the head uh, of uh, <laughs> Austria onto the audience's lap. And yeah. just, I'm just going to take a nap here. And then he comes back and grabs the head later. Like that incorporation of the audience mm -hmm. is like one of the trademarks of, of Shakespeare and his performance. Mm -hmm. Like back in the day, like at the Globe, the audience mm -hmm. played as much of a part with what was happening on the stage as the actors themselves. And mm -hmm. I think it's such a shame nowadays when we see performances uh, of these texts that completely ignore the audience as a presence as if they weren't there at all when there's so many of these soliloquies and speeches that are very clearly meant to be shared with the audience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, for me, Graham Abbey playing uh, Falconbridge was like the pinnacle of that. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, well done. Ryan, how about you? Well, I had quite a few that uh, Shauna McKenna was definitely one and uh, Jennifer Mogbach were also like very close to the top, the two of them. But like one that I feel like maybe doesn't get enough credit is Stephen Russell as the Earl of Salisbury. He mm. like pretty much a minor part for most of it, but like he's in a lot of these scenes with Pembroke, who I believe was played by Brad Rudy. And like, they kind of maybe have a bit of a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern thing between the mm -hmm. two of them. And like these two side characters, very interchangeable, but they mm -hmm. kind of fill out the cast and like are part of the political machinations. But he had this like depth and gravity to him, like Stephen Russell as Salisbury specifically, that even though on the page, it's such a small part, he really almost of this production, at least in the second half, felt like he was kind of the moral center of the whole thing. When like all the, the I don't know if others like thought this too, or if he kind of just like brushed by you, but I, like no, no one wants to comment or thoughts. <laughs> uh, I, I will also, no, Will, you want to say something about it? No, no, I'm, I'm just listening, Ryan. You keep going, buddy. <laughs> I, I also, just to shout out another one, uh, Noah Javala, I think his name is, who played young Arthur. I, yes. I've mentioned this on panels before, like with our moth and love's labors, but I'm a big mm -hmm. sucker for kids who are like able to like nail down the Shakespeare because it's very hard to see like mm -hmm. child actors really do it well and do it justice. Yeah. And if I can do one more, I will say Brian Tree as Cardinal Pandolf was another ah. really like strong presence whenever he came onto the stage. He had this like almost malevolence to him, but mm -hmm. he is this like representative of the church and <laughs> he all of his scenes were just like very like ferocious, conflict driven and mm -hmm. I think is a worth a shout out. Yeah. Yeah. There was such a smooth and soft temperance to his movement whenever he was on the mm -hmm. stage. Like it demanded <laughs> respect as where a lot of the other characters have this very sporadic and uh, catching mm -hmm. movement. So mm -hmm. I think that he really stood out due to that contrast between all the other performers. But yeah, yeah. I completely agree with you, Ryan. Yeah, he definitely took the stage. Mm -hmm. And like we last saw him as Sir Nathaniel in Love's Labors and that was like mm -hmm. a very comical part. So now seeing this in contrast, like he's got the range, I love it. <laughs> like, yeah. He was a wonderful, quiet villain of the story as he kind of mm -hmm. just worked his way. I don't even know if I would stage. call him the I, I villain, know, I, though. I, I know, he's I, I think he's sneaky a... and conniving, but like he he's just doing his <laughs> job in a way. Just like <laughs> I would say, like this might be getting ahead to the more of the tech specific questions, but I'd say if anyone is the villain in this play, it's John himself. But Absolutely. we can put a pin in that for now. <laughs> it, is. it is. But Ryan, why don't you kick us uh, off next with like, what was your favorite production element? production element, I think I have to give it to the costumes. Ah. Because I think there was a lot of just like really interesting, great choices. Like mm -hmm. uh, we've already sort of talked about a little bit. I think the the lion cape of the Duke of Austria, which is in the text, these always talk about his lion skin, but it didn't need to have the head, but that was just such a great detail. <laughs> it's this, fero this ferocity that he's like, wearing he's trying to be like the next Richard the Lionheart maybe but he's like such a weak piddling presence in it who's just like very instantly killed like the second he gets into a fight and so I thought like having that there and then in that same moment that Will was talking about earlier when Falconbridge comes back in with the head he's also carrying the cloak which yeah. was just like this great sort of signifier of I've killed the lion or the <laughs> lion uh, 
uh, I, I loved like so many of the costume things. I think uh, John's like red cape with the little like polka dotted crowns on it was just like <laughs> it fit with the whimsy of the way the character was portrayed, and like it has this sort of like childish this to it i i liked falkenbridge's green tunic which i think kind of like fits in with the greed and the commodity of the his whole kind of thing of the character but if i have to give a shout out to one thing my favorite element of the costume was john's crown which was always seated way too low on his brow and again like i think that's just like such a beautiful like image for like he needs to grow into it he's still very immature even though he's like nearing death and it like approaching i don't know how old he's supposed to be when he dies but he hasn't quite grown into his brother's crown yet mm -hmm. claire do you want to say something about that oh. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's incorrect, but for me, it wasn't a young uh, a young guy having to grow into the crown. I took it as every morning they set it on his head and he pulls it lower. Yes, it's mine, mm -hmm. and I feel like mm -hmm. like when you, um, it's almost like when you're um, when you're out in public with a purse, maybe, and you like bring it closer to yourself, just so mm -hmm. then anyone tried to steal it, like it's near right. your body. And like, that's yeah, that's, that's it's like he like tugs it down so that it is mm -hmm. harder to prize off his skull. And that really fits because at, like in the scene when Pandolf crowns him near the mm -hmm. end, he puts it much like yeah. a higher set and then he immediately pulls it down again. Mm -hmm. And then when Henry comes in at the end and crowns himself as the new king, he also puts it just as low as his father always did. So it's mm -hmm. showing that same, this cycle is repeating. So I thought that was just such a great detail that right. was yeah. definitely... Mm -hmm. Like that detail specifically too, like I think it's a marriage of the two ideas that you guys are talking about. Like it's it's the mental immaturity of King John, like the inability to actually make mature, conscious, rational decisions that are to the benefit of his people uh, versus the benefit of himself. That like where that immaturity of like, this is my crown, this is my power. Like he desperately holds on to it and like needs to make a show of it, right? And like literally creates a furrowed brow by pushing that crown down further. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you guys with the crown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I'm actually going to piggyback off Ryan on this because I think mine ties into this with the direction of, of this piece. Because I found the direction of this piece was absolutely wonderful. Like Tim Carroll assembled a fantastic company of actors who he knew uh, worked really well together because he's worked with a number of them before in his uh, productions of Romeo and Juliet and Peter Pan. But then he also just knew how the, he also knew how they would work with the text and then also just be able to work with that stage. Like we talked about it briefly when we were talking about the women and just how they moved around the stage. But it's just a great way, because that stage is so barren. Like there's not much on except for those two standing candelabras in a balcony. And yet that's it. But yet at the same time, that stage was filled and all, all the movement was so well choreographed to have these great kind of internal images. Like we said, when like, when like uh, what's her name? Blanche of Spain has to choose a hand. Mm -hmm. or, or, or in fact, you got uh, France and England in the middle kind of shaking hands and you, got, and you, got, you, got, you have um, the bishop or a cardinal standing between them or Arthur stuck between his, his mother and his grandmother being kind of clawed, got almost, almost picked apart. Or, 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 or the fact that you have the first scene with um, Phil the Bastard and, and, and his brother and how at the start they're closer together but by the end you see him calculatingly moving closer and closer <laughs> to John and Queen Eleanor. There's such great little directions of creating that movement on stage that I thought was just wonderful. You know, I like, I agree with you, Mac. I think like mm -hmm. those moments in particular are very mm -hmm. nice, but I, I found that there was uh, and no discredit to the director who did an excellent mm -hmm. job with the piece, but it more so is that I didn't find that that level of direction was consistent throughout the entire piece. Mm. There were also a lot of scenes where actors were just standing opposed to each other. Like, you know what I yes. mean? Like, sure, you yeah. could you could make the justifications like these characters are opposed to each other. That's why they're standing <laughs> in such a way. But it's like, it's kind of like a baseline as opposed to the excellent direction we see in other moments, like the circling, yep. the shaking of the hands, the cardinal mm -hmm. rotating around them, like literally mm -hmm. capturing the, the turning of the mind, like the machinations yep. of plotting, right? Like there's some excellent moments mm -hmm. of direction within the piece 100%, but is it consistent throughout the entire piece? I don't think so. Fair. That's totally fair. I just really like some of the images that were captured. Um, yeah. Claire, what about you? Yeah, I think there were some beautiful stage pictures that were very mm -hmm. evocative. Mm -hmm. But I also, um, oh my God, there were so many pictures in this direction that I just looked at my watch. And, it was um, and I think mm -hmm. part of that is that it is, um, there were moments that felt very static to me. It almost felt mm -hmm. like um, the, the director had 
was was trying to like I don't know um, give the text too much power. Like this is where mm. the actor, this is the part where the actor stands and we breathe in the beauty of Shakespeare's language. And I'm mm -hmm. like, that doesn't help me understand what he's saying, though. <laughs> that, doesn't help me, that, doesn't, that doesn't help me like latch on to how politics in this 13th century English world work, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not saying that the production needed to have been 13th century. In fact, I I um I think I would have been even more perhaps uh, distanced from it if it had been in full medieval garb. Um, mm -hmm. But I just like I found so much of it like so much of the direction stagnant. And in fact, when mm -hmm. you the question of like which production element or design did you find most compelling, like that was actually really hard for me because mm -hmm. I found so many of the choices pushed me further out of the story as opposed to drawing me in either emotionally or sort of sociopolitically. Mm -hmm. um, I liked details. I never liked yeah. one thing holistically. I liked details. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. just the, the simple, the fact that King John had the red cape and King Philip had the blue cape. Mm -hmm. Like a detail like that, super useful. Really helps me mm -hmm. understand like who these characters are, their relationship to each other, where the tension is, where mm -hmm. the conflict is. Um, and then novelties like Austria um, lion stole, totally mm -hmm. brilliant. And it was wonderful to sort of see that lion's head in contrast with this like weak willed sort of hyper violent man, um, mm -hmm. who of course was conquered because what else was going to happen to him? Like just the, <laughs> that, you know, things like that I thought were beautiful. Stage pictures like the four corners reaching out hands to Blanche and it being mm -hmm. literally the only time that she's allowed to like own the stage for one time by herself on stage and she's being pulled in four directions, <laughs> um, which is like the experience of being a woman, right? Like it's all about you. Whenever it's all about you, it's because something terrible is happening, not because you like get to enjoy the sunlight. Um, so there were, there were things like that that I thought were so vivid and so evocative. And then there were other moments when I was like, can, can something else happen? <laughs> and I think that's how I would probably clear, like I'm just gonna piggyback off you if that's okay. Um, yeah. Like, I, I think that really captures how I feel about this whole piece. This is a piece that had a lot of interesting choices, but didn't, it wasn't consistent with those interesting choices. For instance, like the one choice that captures that for me is that the entire play was lit by candles. Yeah. Like which- Well, I will, interesting. I will add into that. It is the illusion that the whole thing is lit by candles, but they do have Fair. the actual grid. They even <laughs> made a point of specifying that in one so, of the YouTube feature ads this, because- The suggestion, sorry, the suggestion <laughs> yes, that it's all exactly. lit by candles, I should have said. <laughs> But the point is, is like, it's an interesting choice. But it, mm -hmm. like you said, Claire, like it made the whole piece feel static. Like, yes, there was an eventual dimming of the lights because eventually candles begin to dim um, right. as they keep burning. So by the end of the play, it feels as though the candles are burning out. And, you know, obviously there's some symbolic representation of what that means for the characters. Mm -hmm. But overall is that because it was literally this slow burn of lighting the entire show, it starts to lull you into this sense of, uh, what's the right word to say? Uh, not bland, but um, like a trance-like state almost, like you're just mm -hmm. kind of watching things happen mm -hmm. as opposed to participating in what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I absolutely uh, I, I agree with you on that. Like, like this production wasn't the, it wasn't perfect. There wasn't one element that I was like, absolutely 10 out of 10. There were moments of greatness and there are other moments of, yeah, which will, which, 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 which actually I'll kick this one off and then, and, and, and then, cause I don't think anybody else will have this, but it was like the fight direction of this play. Like they had that great fight between, um, what's his name? Philip the bastard in Austria, where I was like, Oh great. Like we're in a battle scene. We're gonna get some lot of great combat. It's like, Oh wait, they're all just running on with flags. And Oh, we get one moment in the entire play where there's a lot of battles of a fight scene. Like that was like, and that, that bugged me because I was like, I know that Tom Patterson is actually a really great space to do all those fights because of the space you have. Like I saw the production of Titus Andronicus that was there um, with, with John Vickery a few years before this. I think it was like 2011. And they used that whole stage for some great combat moments where they were moving around the stage and doing all this great fighting. And here it was like, oh, like this is all we're getting. Like this is kind of really kind of letting me down. Like, I, I, I know we can do better with, with this play. And I think that would, would have helped kind of, because I mean, like when you get the Richards and the Henrys uh, plays, like they have some great combat in them. And we've seen that, like we don't kind of expect that. And here it was like, oh. I will like, say, yeah. Mac, I kind of have two thoughts about this. Mm. First of all, like, yes, we do have that one tiny little fight between Austria and Falconbridge, but in the text, like it's that scene begins with, and the bastard enters holding the head. So the fact that they included a fight at all is their own decision that like has to be like, mm -hmm. yes, Will, do you want an answer to that? 
<laughs> I just kind of wanted to to balance off that though, because like mm-hmm. I I think that they could have put a lot. If they're going to include a fight scene, they should one it should be included to enhance the story, which I think it could have. Uh, but mm-hmm. they should be putting more. I guess and I agree with Mac. I, I don't feel that the fight that did happen was very compelling. It it mm-hmm. felt very choreographed. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that too is that they put so much effort into like these two musical numbers that occur within the piece, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and. Like that seems so well choreographed and so well organized and then seeing mm-hmm. a fight scene that didn't it's like where does the like because spectacleism is part of any show we have to acknowledge that it's like mm-hmm. where was the priority of spectacle in this piece it, it felt more towards these musical numbers that kind of mm-hmm. i don't know if, it, if you guys felt it but it felt like kind of an afterthought to me mm-hmm. um where they, it's yeah. like they're nice yeah. but they're they didn't feel like they were mm-hmm. pushing the story forward necessarily yeah yeah claire like to- how about you yeah, I'd like to jump off of that because I actually, I really liked that that single fight scene that isn't, that's, it's extra textual. It's not actually mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciated that it looked choreographed, mm-hmm. that it was short and kind of boring, and then they ran off stage and he put on the head. Because to me, that choice reinforces the fact that this is a political satire, mm-hmm. right? We don't want, we don't want a Henry V at Agincourt type battle in this play. Mm-hmm. We want it to look childish. We want it to look vindictive and reactive mm-hmm. and like stupid. These guys are just fighting over nothing over and over again and it's stupid mm-hmm. and that's the point. Um, mm-hmm. And so I was actually, I was totally ready to give Tim Carroll the benefit of like the doubt and be like, oh, that's that's all part of the, um, that's all part of his plan to like, mm-hmm. manifest mm-hmm. or reveal the uselessness of the continual war that this play is inviting us to look at. Um, and then there were these crazy choreographed, super spectacular musical numbers. And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, yeah. see that, if, you, if you wanted to make that choice, the numbers should not have been in the play. And if they were, then they needed to be just as underdeveloped, just as under choreographed, just yeah. as kind of useless and, and awkward as that fight. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. to me, the play is about pulling back the curtain on the um, the idiocy <laughs> of these powerful men making choices that just cost people their lives and like how petty mm-hmm. it all is. That's what the play invites us to look at. And mm-hmm. then when you have like a big spectacular musical number, I'm like, oh no, you're, we're still trying to glorify this yeah. somehow. Mm-hmm. It, like a counterpoint that I, I would have to ask the director because he's the only one that could possibly answer the question is like, was the fight meant to be satirized in that way? Is that if that was the case, I wish it was a bit more intentional. Like I wish it was more clear because mm-hmm. it, it's right on that line of like, was it intentionally rough? <laughs> like was it yeah. intentionally Corey? Mm-hmm. And like whenever something is within that realm for me as a viewer and as an audience member, like it, it doesn't land well. You know, like mm-hmm. it, if it's supposed to be satire, it should play a satire. And, and mm-hmm. that's where I stand on that. But I completely agree with you on the musical numbers. And that, I guess that's maybe the juxtaposition because the musical numbers were very clearly like choreographed and done mm-hmm. intentionally well. And then this fight mm-hmm. scene, which is within that same realm of spectacleism, wasn't. And so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm left wondering, like, was it intentional? Was it not? What was the take? Why do it that way? And like, mm-hmm. I will I'm say, not looking to be spoon fed, but when it comes to spectacle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For the fight directing, though, while there is that one obvious scene where, yes, there are two characters clashing blades, there is another moment of very subtle fight directing that I think does deserve a shout out, though. And that is the moment when Hubert is holding the letter, the decree, and John takes Hubert's sword and sticks it against him. It's like not a big fight scene, but they would have had to do fight directing because they're using the steel. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was a very potent moment. It's like the most serious John was in the entire production when he's Mm -hmm. otherwise being this like clownish man child. (laughs) Will, you're, (laughs) you look like you're guffawing. (laughs) I I don't know if I completely agree with that take on John, that that like it was just one big defining serious moment. I think there were some excellent moments in the second half of the play uh, where we get to see some of those darker attributes of the character, but Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get into that when I start talking about the weakest aspect of the production, in my opinion. Fair, Uh, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, if if everyone's okay, I can jump in now. Sure. Yeah. Um, And it's funny, too, because, like, don't don't misunderstand me. Tom McCamus, I think, did an excellent job in both the first half and the second half of the play. (laughs) For me, the problem comes in that it didn't feel... I felt like I got two versions of John between the two uh, halves of these play of this mm-hmm. play, where the first half was very much in towards that satire that Ryan's talking about, like this kind of like intentionally uh, like quiet and bumbling element to this character, uh, where we're able to laugh at John a lot. But then mm-hmm. in the second half of the play, we get this very intense and dark, like mind losing uh, aspect of King John, and and I mm-hmm. think that for this play to work well, and and I I 
don't want to point fingers because it's impossible to ever tell the creative team like where the issue lies in some of these things. Mm -hmm. But I found that we didn't see enough of the those darker elements of King John that we find in the second half within the first half of the play. And we didn't see mm -hmm. enough of those lighter elements of King John in the second half of the play that we got in the first half. And so the characters, mm -hmm. like the character didn't feel consistent to me throughout the entire piece, even mm -hmm. though Tom McCamus did an excellent job representing both of these versions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's strange because I felt like the, the second half of the play, John, King John and Tom McCamus' uh, representation of King John blended so much uh, more clearly with the other cast of actors on the stage and the other characters and how they were being mm -hmm. represented. As where I found in the first half, because of the, the lighter elements that were coming through on King John, he mm -hmm. kind of got washed away with some of the more intense voices on the stage. Um, mm -hmm. But, and, and again, I, I think Tom McCamus did an excellent job. I just think in terms of the consistency between the two halves of the play, there, there could have been a little bit more blending I want to hear what Claire has to say about this because yes. that face yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is a point so well taken. And mm -hmm. if it weren't for the person running my country, I think I would it. Right? I think I would be like okay. however and I, I I know it was not in, it meant this way because it was done in 2014. I get that. But like let us consider for a minute um, the fact that it actually is those stunted man children who are petty and ridiculous to the point of being kind of entertaining and funny mm -hmm. that can be capable of the most atrocious cruelty, mm -hmm. right? And it's, they are funny and entertaining right up until the moment they're not. They are, they are a, they are a party trick right up until the moment they're not. And that mm -hmm. is how I feel like this production and the actor approached John, where it was like, we, we laugh at his, at his pettiness, his impetuousness, his narcissism, because it looks funny at first. Mm -hmm. And then in the second half of the play, I think we are invited to consider that actually he has had a, a moral cavity all along. Mm -hmm. It's just that now that he's no longer performing in a way that seems funny and endearing, and he's like making, he's making sort of bigger choices, we, we realized that like, it was never funny. <laughs> it was never entertaining. It was, it was and, he was always, cap like he always had the capacity for this. So I don't know mm -hmm. if, how much that was intentional on the production's part, but at least for me, it worked. And, and, I, and I can agree with all of that. I, I guess what I was looking for more is just moments of indicating the opposite you know what i mean like in the like i just wish that there were one or two more moments in the first half of the play where we saw him lose his temper a little bit more or we saw him lash out a little bit more aggressively towards somebody just something to show us like the that moral cavity you're talking about is missing and then we explore that more in depth in the second half of the play mm -hmm. because it just felt like a like and i get it it's two sides of the same coin and that's kind of what i and you're right i that is certainly a good take on it um but i just wish we kind of got a peek on the other side of the coin before we got there because again, mm -hmm. it just felt like a flip. Yeah, totally valid, totally valid. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan, how about you? I, I, I don't know if well, we've touched on anything of yours yet. Well, the, okay, so I confided in Mac what I was going to talk about for this section, and I was expecting mm -hmm. we would all be in agreement about this, but based on some of the answers we've gotten so far, I feel like I'm in the minority for this opinion. Ooh. My kind of biggest critique of this production is that it felt to me like it was over-prioritizing comedy just through and through, like, even though, like, it kind of settles into a more, like, dramatic seriousness at the end, it's still, uh, to me, everything felt comical, but so seldom funny, and I know comedy is subjective that way, so if I didn't find it as funny, maybe others do, that's not the big thing, but mm -hmm. to me, I think the big kind of problem I have, and I'm kind of in agreement with you, Will, here, is that I kind of pin all of this, again, we can't know who exactly is to blame, but I pin all of this kind of on Tom McCamus and Graham Abbey. The two of them, in my opinion, felt like they were in their whole separate play altogether that was a broadly drawn farce. And because the two of them combined have 40% of the lines in the whole play, everyone else who I thought was very serious, like, was doing their own like kind of serious business. It just felt like two separate plays 
bumping into each mm-hmm. other most of the time. Mm-hmm. And like, I can forgive Abby a little bit for mm-hmm. this, a little more so than McCamus, because like Falcon Bridge is, I think, a funnier character on the page. Although his like hang that calf skin on those recreant limbs thing that gets tiresome after the third time, even on the page. But like, he is this kind of like obnoxious twerp in a lot of it. But he was like really leaning into the comedy mm-hmm. there, and like. Well, the moment that you singled out as like one of your favorites there where he hands the head to the audience member to me like while i thought that was a very clever choice and i love when the audience is integrated in that way i thought this isn't a moment we should be laughing at he just killed someone and like <laughs> well and i think vicely though that's the power of that moment is that we do feel that we shouldn't be laughing at it and yet we are like, i didn't get the read from the audience the in the video because the audience in the video seemed to be like ha 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 wonderful like i i was like like stirring in my seat like this shouldn't be a funny moment and maybe that was the point but to me i thought like that felt like very tonally jarring but I think for McCamus more so because he really was playing this funny version of the character, which I think does work. And it is also consistent with what the character should be. But like, I think the version of King John that I think he's was trying to ape the most was the 1973 Disney Robin Hood one, which Peter Ustinov played who he's like sucking his thumb and calling for his mommy. And like <laughs> that, that I think is like the most clear, like intertextual reference that he was drawing from in his performance here. Mm. But there were just so many moments that I felt like there were layers that could have been found, but he just like went on too long and too much with this like comical performance. Like I wrote down a few of them while I was watching, but, like uh, when he, w- when Philip the bastard gives him the news about Peter of Pomfret and he starts laughing, this is in uh, act four scene two and he laughs and he just goes on for too long that the audience wasn't laughing along with him because it's like a sign of his insanity and you shouldn't laugh. But when he just goes on and on, they start to laugh out of pure discomfort that like, I don't know what to do. So I just guess I'm going to laugh. But like if he had just stopped like a millisecond (laughs) shorter, I think it would have like really been like a powerful moment. And then later in that same scene when uh, everyone else leaves and he's alone to just cry that his mother's dead, he's crying for so long in this pitiful way that the audience Again, it wasn't good laughing at first, but it just gets so uncomfortable that they have to laugh at some point. And I don't, I think it would have been such a more nuanced play overall in this performance in particular if he just tightened those moments and wasn't always going for the arch comedy. Oh, this is so strange, Ryan. You and I never have this, but like, I 100% disagree with you. Like, I think that's the, <laughs> of the comedy in this play. Like, those, when we push our audiences into uncomfortable states of being where we almost feel like all we can do is laugh, like, we are left mm-hmm. asking ourselves later on, why was mm-hmm. I laughing at that? Like what, like, what part of my brain allows myself to be able to laugh at this torture, at this misery, mm-hmm. at this Which anger, I think at this murder, right? Like, and I, I think those are powerful things to leave with the audience. See, I agree with you on that if the laughter is sincere, but if we're just laughing out of uncomfort or discomfort because it's just going on for so long, I don't think that's, like, really genuine. Like the moment with the head i understand because that is like a guess this is a funny thing that's happening in this otherwise dark moment agree with you on that one but yeah i think all of those like moments where they were just laughing because isn't it absurd this is going on for so long like family guy basically but like i i don't feel like that's a very sincere laughter that we're really gonna scrutinize our own reaction to after the fact claire what are your thoughts I think I tend to, to stray more on Will's side only because I really, really do read this play and especially this production as as a, as a political satire. I do not think that this production is altogether like effective in mm-hmm. conveying that, but I think that's what it's leaning towards. I think that's what it wants to be. But mm-hmm. I I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention that like I thought the weakest part of this production was in the optics of it. Like mm. I was like I I, mean, I was profoundly disturbed by the token diversity in this cast <laughs> and and the um and i found uh and then i found the, the clothing that they were wearing totally alienating me from the emotional authenticity and or political resonance of the story so like this was a majorly white cast um there was one dark-skinned black woman who played a character who has like four lines um and is is given in gift 
in marriage, right? That's, that's, <laughs> like I was sitting here and I was like, is anyone else seeing this? I was talking to no one because I was watching it by myself. But like, I was like, I just felt so, I felt so uncomfortable and it was not, I could tell that it was not, um, it was not cast intentionally in terms of like, mm -hmm. in terms of, we weren't, we weren't being invited to learn something about the play. Mm -hmm. but, Although I will say, if I could chime in on that briefly, the fact that a character named Blanche is the one woman of color in the play, Blanche meaning white, I think that was clearly a deliberate, like, haha, aren't we clever kind of choice, but like... Sure, but like, <laughs> but I, yes, and I'm on I Claire's agree. side with this. Because I like, agree, I, yeah. I look at their production of Macbeth, where it's like, you, you could justify, I don't know what the justification, if there was a justification to the cast at the time, but like, Macbeth had an entire clan and family you know uh represented in the diversity in like BIPOC communities and yet here we have a show that is just predominantly white and with one and I agree with your points completely clear about like this one black actress who is literally used in that function in that form like that I don't know it just felt a little bit shallow to me when we already have another representation of a play mind you later years down the line yeah it's where hard to compare these things that we're watching in order yeah no of course it, it, <laughs> it just felt a bit baseline to me mm -hmm. yeah it, it was so to me it was um it was cowardly i was like i, I it's particularly with regard to the bastard i was like why mm -hmm. is a 35 year old ex frat boy who's like conventionally attractive cisgendered seems to have never been told to shut down like shut up and sit down in his entire life why is he the other why why is why is he the one on the outskirts of the story like making sassy and snarky asides and like getting the audience on his side and be like, look, I'm going to play the game against them. I'm like, you literally benefit from the game. There's nothing about you. There is nothing about you that, that convinces me that you have ever, that you have had anything but a luxurious life of like cis white male privilege. Right. And like, if, even if the other characters had just treated him with more disdain at the beginning, then like maybe I could have at least bought this. Cause I think he's a good actor. I just think he was, like profoundly miscast and i was like why why is it um uh why is it Mogbach like playing the bastard right like why isn't she philip like she like that to me makes way more sense in the, in the context of like showing the um uh the disparity and the, in the inequity and just the kind of um uh like narrow-minded white cruelty of this like upper tier of the monarchy right um like why can't we have someone that like so obviously would be outcast from the inner mm -hmm. sanctum playing that that role right mm -hmm. um and so and then when you add in i think you have that sort of just totally unimaginative and kind of un un unprogressive casting blended with the fact that they're all wearing the you know the renaissance garb that we sort of associate with op shakespeare production um, where the women can't even move because they're so like bound in with corsets and skirts and giant sleeves and you know and the men are in like puffy pants and hats with plumes and they're I, I'm not learning anything about um, about the reality of politics or power or corruption um, I'm not I'm I'm just I'm distanced I'm distanced from why this why I'm supposed to care about mm -hmm. this production um, because of like the way that it's cast and the way that it's like aesthetically presented and and i'm just gonna kind of tr like pivot off of that too to return to something that ryan mentioned earlier is where you know there was so much prioritization of comedy in this play and like mm -hmm. i think it's uh, this play lies in such a difficult realm because without comedy without brevity without lightness this play drags man i don't know if you've ever sat down and tried to read this play like read this play or if you've seen a production of it that is done with all those serious undertones but like wow wow it is one of shakespeare's most like dense and boring plays to read and i and i say that with all love and affection to shakespeare <laughs> you guys know mm -hmm. um but it for me like I, I disagree a little bit ryan with your point that you made earlier mm -hmm. like i think it needs the comedy it needs that lightness i, I don't I think it, it needed much. no comedy i just thought it tipped over into the too much point with yeah. And part of and my critique was that, like, these two actors were doing everything comedic and the rest of the cast was doing the straight serious. That that's where the disjointedness felt for me. And then I guess that's what I was going to say, though, is, like, it, I don't necessarily think it was the prioritization of the comedy that lacked. And this is returning to what Claire was just talking about. I, I think it was the the absence of, uh, like, uh, politic. Like, the absence of the depth in the, in the underlying tones of the show. Because mm -hmm. just as easily, like, for instance, like, one thing you could do is you could cast the entire French royal family like not historically correct but if you cast the entire french royal family as black that creates 
a whole new context of the piece entirely, yes. right? Like, mm. it's just something, yeah. and, and that's just a what if, like that's a very mm. throwaway idea, but at the same time, like it opens up more representation within the cast and also adds this interesting political undertone to the entire piece. Mm. And like, I think if even that was, and then laced with the level of comedy that was still in the piece, I think that could have been incredible. And yet yeah. we, we missed this golden opportunity. And yeah. And then if you have yeah. Blanche, if you have Blanche as an actor who's neither white nor black, either mixed or like some other <laughs> other race or ethnicity, and they've got the four hands reaching out to her, like imagine that moment. Mm -hmm. Imagine what that would like mean and how, how much more viscerally we would feel the enormity mm -hmm. of that that they're like forcing this 13 year old to make, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. I mean, I, I mean, I do have a rebuttal to the Philip part, but I will get to that because we will talk about that when we get more into our play questions. So I'm, I'm putting a pin in that part because I, I do have something for, about, about Philip the Bastard. Uh, but in the meantime, Will, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you start off this next one, which is... Oh, no, I was hoping you... I wouldn't start this one. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to. I want you to. You're, you're going to be uh, very not blown away by my answer. <laughs> I bet I won't be. I think um, we've got but... enough sense of where everyone stands on this now yes. that I think we all yes. know what our answers are going to be. <laughs> exactly. But, well, do you think this production hit the mark, and is it worth the watching? Oh. Okay, so... This is hard for me because it, it has its redeeming moments. And, and uh, like we've already talked about, most of those redeeming moments are in the comedy of the piece, the mm -hmm. audience interaction, the costumes of the piece, although being <laughs> very alienating for a modern audience without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problem that I had with the piece, and it's something that gets brought up a lot in the training that I do with the Toronto Theatre Academy is like the concept of like, don't cast a, like a pit bull as a poodle type of mentality. And mm -hmm. I think what ended up happening here, and I've talked about this earlier with like the orchestration of the voice of the cast, is like each individual actor did well, but I felt that their voices were quite clashing to the point where some characters overshadowed other characters just by the nature mm -hmm. and the timber of their voice, um, mm -hmm. which is why I think in the first half of the play, Tom McCamus got a little bit like when I was talking about earlier, how he just kind of felt his voice has a much softer and rounder quality in contrast to, you know, say Graham Abbey, who has this very like bludgeoning and, and hitting voice. Um, and then we have like a lot of piercing voices around him in terms of like the, like it's able to shoot through the audience intensely and really catch attention. And so mm -hmm. in contrast, like we kind of lose the attention on this, well, the titular character of the entire piece. Like what we're here to kind of see is the, the fall of this king in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, we, we, I also talked earlier about like how I just kind of felt the two halves of the play weren't really connected in terms of King John and the development of the mm -hmm. character. We weren't really seeing those qualities enough. Mm -hmm. I think the, the line that most accurately captures what I felt was missing in this piece is mad world, mad kings. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't sense the madness, like, unfortunately, until like the last 30 minutes of the play. And then I'm like, oh, there it is. Um, but like, you know, the fact that that line, Mad World, Mad Kings, happens in what, like Act 2, start of Act 3 or something? Like, at so early on to say that line, mm -hmm. and it just didn't feel justified in the rest of the play. Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, and like the King of France caught it a little bit more. I'm, 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 forgetting, I'm forgetting his name as I'm speaking right now, and I yeah. apologize profusely for that. Uh, I think Philip is the character, the actor is Peter Hunt. Yeah. I don't know which one you were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, like uh, King John, I just felt needed a little bit more of that madness in the earlier parts of the play. Uh, mm. I think if we had that, like just the light sprinkling of that, that mad king quality within the first half, everyone else could have remained the exact same and we would have had a very intriguing production to watch. Mm -hmm. um, did this hit the mark for me? Not quite, uh, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. It just, it, yeah. it didn't have a lot to say politically. It didn't have a lot to say like, you know, from a mm -hmm. philosophical standpoint for me either. Um, mm -hmm. The portrayals of all the characters were fun and they were interesting. I just don't think they mm -hmm. meshed well together. And I think mm -hmm. it's more of an issue of the casting of the piece more than anything. And we've talked mm -hmm. about that a little bit already. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Claire, how about you? Yeah, it definitely didn't hit the mark for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did, I mean, I, it was accomplished. Mm -hmm. That's the word that I wrote in my notes. It was accomplished. And as, as everyone has said, like, the actors individually did, did beautiful work with their text and their characters. It's very mm -hmm. clear that they're all well trained and well. Um, I mean, even saying well trained is a little bit elitist. They've all they all have experience mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with this with this kind of text. Um, when I, if I'm going to invest in three hours of my life to watch a Shakespeare play, mm -hmm. then I, I'm looking for two things, right? I'm looking for emotional authenticity, 
why do why am I supposed to care about mm -hmm. the characters or at least some of the characters? Why should I why should I care about them? And the other question I want answered is like, what am I going to learn about the world that we live in politically or socially that I have not thought of that way before? Right? Like why are we telling this story now? Why did this play now? Um, and I didn't feel like either of those questions got satisfying answers for me. Mm -hmm. The only character that I really cared about was Blanche, did nothing, <laughs> and then like vanishes. <laughs> so um, he was the only one that like, like even, even Constance, who I love on the page so much, mm -hmm. um, even that performance for me, I was like, you're, you're, you're powerful, you're defiant, you're articulate. And I was like, but I don't, I don't sense the abandonment. Like I don't sense the surrender to grief that I want. And mm -hmm. I think part of that is because she was wearing a costume that would not allow her to. Um, mm -hmm. But also I was just like, there is this, um, there's this veneer of professionalism that is like binding up the performances mm -hmm. and like binding up the production. And I just found that really like, like just disappointing and uninteresting. Like I wanted, mm -hmm. I wanted the, the moments to me that stuck out were the messy moments. They were the moments of, of sort of like laxity and and mm. less professionalism like philip giving it like the bastard giving the head or the like mm -hmm. grandam rhetoric when you see that these two you know venerable women are both still like 12 year old school girls pulling each other's hair like moments like that where i felt like the um the stratford festival element like became irrelevant or was set aside mm -hmm. those were the moments that i was drawn into the story um mm -hmm. but i just felt you know based on the way it was uh, there was this um I don't know, there was this gauze. There was this gauze between me and most of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and that was partly due to the casting. I just was so, I was like, this is so many white people. Um, and, it was, and it was partly because of, of um, the elegance of the way it was staged. And I was just, mm -hmm. ultimately I didn't learn anything about politics and I didn't learn anything about a mother's grief and I didn't learn mm -hmm. anything about what happens to the world when men don't listen to women. Like I yeah. didn't, I just didn't come away with any of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, missed for me. Ryan? Yeah, like I'm also, I'm conflicted, but leaning more towards the side of, I don't think it really hit the mark for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, like there's just a, so many great moments and things and little performances in there that like I wanna just say, yes, this is good. And I, when, when it was good, it was really good. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of just like as a whole, yeah, I really think a lot of it didn't stick together. It had a lot of potential, but and like Claire, I think it was funny what you said earlier about like why this show right now and with a big Shakespeare specializing company like Stratford, I think it's always the same reason. It's which one haven't we done in a while? Because <laughs> Which one fits the theme that, 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 that we're producing this season? Well, it's not even because the, the themes are very malleable and it's easy to get around, but it's just with there's 38 plays, which one haven't we done in a while? We do at least like four Shakespeare plays every year. Eventually we got to cycle back through them. And I think mm. I, you did make a good point point earlier though about how you know relating king john to trump a bit obviously that wasn't the case when this was filmed but i do see those resonances having some interesting impact like watching it now in 2020 uh i think certainly more so than that like caesar production that everybody was like fawning over in the news that like caesar is not a trump that's like such a bad like comparison <laughs> to, to draw us so i think king yes. john could be the the play for the trump era mm. but but this production kind of maybe didn't like needle all of that out in a way um mac you usually phrase this question to me and uh would i recommend this to my students mm. <laughs> um I will say this is the first King John production I've ever seen. I've read it on the page, so I have like the imaginary version that I would picture in my head, but I don't have like a good comparison. I say watch this one instead. And I'm always like of the mind that just watch any Shakespeare play, get an idea, you'll get something from it, even if you don't love everything about it or as a whole, it doesn't really work. So if we were studying King John in like a theater history survey or a Shakespeare mm -hmm. specialty class, I would still recommend this one as mm -hmm. something to try on for size and see what ideas you are able to pull from it. Yes. I mean, for me, my first note is this version is uh, cornered the King John market of Shakespeare recordings since there are like barely any, if any, <laughs> recordings of this play. So if you are going to show it to, or, or, or if you're going to study it in a survey class, then like you don't really have many options to not show mm -hmm. this filmed version. So I think that was smart on Stratford's part where they can make some nice 
bit of money on, on people who have to buy this <laughs> version to show students if they're going to do it. Uh, mind you, that being said, I don't think overall it hit the mark. I think, as we said, there were moments that there were mm -hmm. some great bits. Like, I, like, I would definitely want to show a class be like, look at how certain supporting characters can, can still own the stage, even when they're not front row, like I, 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 Constance and um, Queen Eleanor, who are who have, sure. who, have, who have very powerful moments on stage, but they are not the main characters. Like, there's a lot of times where the camera pans over to them, and they're standing quietly, but you can see just little glances they do to each other or just small reactions they give to a moment you can still get a lot of who they are and just kind of and just kind of that being in the moment scene with these characters so i think for that i would use this more as a clip yeah uh, uh a, we're worthy of like some clip work versus like let's watch the entire three hour extravaganza of king john if i could even chime into that i think of yes. all the ones we've watched in this stratford on film series so far Mm -hmm. cinematically this is one of the most interesting ones mm. because just like in terms of like there was like so many weird film moments like the the obvious one that comes to mind is arthur jumping from the balcony that they did in this like crazy slow motion of like the yeah. and like, and like and i don't think it's like necessarily like good great choice but just like the audacity and boldness of just like mm -hmm. uh, there was the great camera angle from the balcony looking down on constance when she comes in in act three all disheveled because arthur's been taken yeah. Prisoner, like, oh, I feel like we haven't seen a lot of like very dynamic camera work and editing in mm -hmm. these series so far, which is just yeah. it, like shout out to Barry Average, who we mm -hmm. who's like directed or produced pretty much all of these yeah. like productions that we've watched, and we like never name him because we're not really talking about the film versions, <laughs> even though that's how we're encountering them. But like, yeah. th like when you've done this many of them, it's like cool that he's trying to make interesting choices, even if they're bizarre in the moment. Yeah, for sure. For sure. She wasn't, she, her hair was dead. Yes, she wasn't. I, that was me in my head thinking she should be disheveled and grafting that into the moment. Yes, she wasn't actually in the staging of it, correct? <laughs> All right, so now we're going to head into our questions that are uh, about the play in particular. So we're going to go into a little bit more textual side of things here. So the first question I have is, why do we think Shakespeare wrote this play entirely in verse? What is the significance of this choice? And actually, I'm, I'm, I want to kick this one off because I do have a, I actually have a little speech I've written for this. And it does tie back to my- Is the speech in verse, Nick? Did you count no. the syllables? <laughs> I wish I did. I wish I did. Uh, but no, this actually, actually also ties back into what I said earlier about Philip and being the bastard. Hmm. Because I think it was actually smart to cast Graham Abbey in this part because he's supposed to fit in with this world of, of of the white men he's not supposed to be there because he is the son of richard as his mother tells him mm -hmm. and the fact that he has to speak in verse and not be the other in this situation because he just fits into this kingly world so if you have him be physically or or or, or, or visually othering then that would just make him I... I would contest that on just the grounds that if Lady Falconbridge and Robert Falconbridge were also of color, and then he could okay, perhaps fine. be so a mixed race himself, that would show sure. that he doesn't necessarily belong in either world. Sure. Could sure. be like a great visual way of doing that. Absolutely. Well, definitely. Sorry, I, I was going to leave the assumption that we're going to keep Bridget Wilson as Lady Falconbridge. I mean, if we're going to... Like, we love her, but we, we do. could recast we do. the whole thing if we want. <laughs> we do. We do. I mean, in general, I think the reason why this is written in verse was to show the audience that the game of politics isn't played by the common man. It's played by this upper echelon, this royal group of people, this, the, 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 this upper classman game of politics and wars played by these people who are, um, who, who are, who are, who, who are basically playing, who are basically playing, playing politics. And it's that thing of also with the language where, because this was performed in like even in Shakespearean time, if you write something in verse to the ear, the audience is going to know, oh, royalty, we're playing, or this is a different time period. We're not common. Like, there's no common characters in this play. They're all higher class people. So the minute you start writing things in verse, it allows that more poetic royal language to come through. And that's where I kind of go, well, that's why I probably wrote in verses, because it gives that class status and showing who plays this game of politics. It's not the fall stats or, 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 or the rude mechanicals. It's the King John types, the, 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 the Kings, like even or Arthur or Constance or Queen Eleanor, all these kind of politic playing people who all speak in this higher 
poetic language than say everybody else. My only question off of that, Mac, is like, mm. do we not have characters in other Shakespearean plays that are nobility that don't speak in verse or characters that aren't nobility that do speak in verse? Like the answer is yes. Um, like, I don't yeah, know if absolutely. I agree with necessarily that the entire play is written in verse for the sake of representing nobility on the stage. Uh, I think maybe like that, that um, what you were talking about, maybe the representation of like a different time could be something a little bit more akin, like a, kind of like the glorification of the English history which is so mm -hmm. common <laughs> um, yeah. within these types of plays. Um, I don't know, because King Richard II is also written entirely in verse. Um, mm -hmm. Those are two very different kings and two very different plays. At first, maybe I, I thought it had to do with keeping the play moving forward, because whenever you do things in verse with iambic pentameter, especially in uh, Old English or King's English, mm -hmm. it's like it, it tends to move along quite quickly, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, if it's in prose. Um, I it, this is hard for me because like I I think it did add a sense of brevity to the piece that did keep it moving along. I think without mm -hmm. it the piece would have dragged. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of why it's in in verse though, I I can't find a serious connecting thread between it and any other play that uses verse like as heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Like again, King Richard the Second being the other play that uses like entirely verse the entire show through. Um, mm -hmm. I I don't find much of a through line between the two. I don't know. I mean, I, I, can, I can see some similarities between King, King John and King, and King Richard II. They're both not great rulers who are very insecure in their positions. So they're both thematically very similar, like, if, you, if, if you're lining them up. Like, they're both not sure. great rulers to end up kind and of... They're, all, the they're both about, like, succession yeah. and who should be yeah. the actual king. That's, sure. like, a Correct. thread. And why isn't Richard III also written entirely in verse? Hmm. Because I, I, like, I guess for me, well, I always like yeah. I always yeah. look for the the juxtaposing point. Is like, wait, if if that's the case, then why isn't this other play that is because also a history play that also represents those mentalities? I would Fair. say I would say I would say maybe Richard the Third isn't written in verse because once again, Richard Third was a propaganda piece. So why have your ruler? Speak Richard the Second was also a propaganda piece, though. He was, he, he, he was, but Shakespeare came uh, came Richard the Second in a different way. Richard the Third was someone much closer historically to these uh to to to, to to the elizabethan period right so if you could i mean you could have it where richard the third like have him speak in common verse or or, or common not uh, or uh, prose not verse because it's like once again it's bringing his character down it's showing that he doesn't speak the higher level of verse that these other royal characters would so once again for the audience i don't know i mean i'm not shakespeare unfortunately claire what do you think about all this you've been very quiet well, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, Yay. <laughs> so I personally think that it's part of the satirical angle. Mm -hmm. All You have a bunch of kings and courtiers and noblemen mm -hmm. who are technically adhering to the formal structure of heightened, poetic, quote unquote, mm -hmm. elegant or highborn language. But what they are often actually saying mm -hmm. amounts to nothing more than petty insults, right? Mm -hmm. Self-serving rhetoric, low mm -hmm. register humor, the things that we, the things that we would maybe expect to hear from mm -hmm. the lower casts of, of Shakespeare's mm -hmm. um, characters, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think that um, a lot of times Shakespeare uses prose to indicate that a character is like dialing back their rhetoric or that Shakespeare mm -hmm. wants to dial back their rhetoric that they can't make as mm -hmm. elegant an argument perhaps as someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that it is all part of the satire that these characters are speaking in a, a formal poetic structure um, mm -hmm. that was used to make very compelling rhetorical arguments. Mm -hmm. And almost none of them can make compelling rhetorical arguments with the exception of like the women who are um, abused, kind of like pushed around by the system and then like unceremoniously slaughtered off stage. Um, <laughs> at the same time, I would also argue that this is a Shakespeare who doesn't actually yet know what he can do with prose, right? Mm -hmm. I think if Shakespeare wrote King John later in his career, you bet your ass Philip the Bastard would have been speaking in prose in those soliloquies mm -hmm. to the audience. Mm -hmm. But when Shakespeare wrote this play, he was in the middle of um, what some scholars call the lyric year, um, mm -hmm. in which he was responding to this new vogue of poetry influenced mm -hmm. by Philip Sidney's, you know, defense of poesy. Um, mm -hmm. He was writing Richard II, a Midsummer Night's Dream, Romeo and Juliet, and Love's Labor's Lost. He was looking at and thinking about poetry and what, like, what it means, what it is, what it can do, and its limitations. And he's writing this play as he's writing those four highly poetic, highly lyrical plays. They're all happening at the same time for him. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was like, okay, so 
this is what I'm doing with poetry and RMJ, and this is what I'm doing with poetry and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And he gets to King John and he's like, what if poetry didn't sound poetic? What if I used the rules of poetry and everyone just sounded like a childish whiny baby? What if, that, what if, what if I tried to do that with, with poetry? Because he's trying to do weird things with poetry in all the other four plays. Mm -hmm. And I just, I wonder if like, this is all just part of his own um, interrogation of what poetry is and what he can do. Because he writes Henry the Fourth Part One after this, like a couple of years after this. And I wonder if he gets to that point when he writes 1H4 and he's like, oh damn it, I missed a trick. You know what I mean? Like I should have, I should have put some of Hal's wonderful, um, you know, highly incisive um, prose type speeches into King John, mm -hmm. but it was after the fact, before he realized he even had that capacity as a writer to make the prose its own kind of poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, there are times for me to, I'm just kind of like piggybacking off of a lot of what you just said there, but there are times too where it just kind of feels like Shakespeare's flexing a little bit. <laughs> Uh, where it's very much like, oh, look how witty I can be while maintaining uh, verse. Like, look how witty I can be while maintaining this heightened poetic language. Um, which, it, mind you, is also not uncommon in Shakespeare's texts in, in terms of the contemporaries he was keeping up with. Like, he very actively, like, threw some shade uh, to use some modern <laughs> language uh, at some of the other people he was working against, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, so it wouldn't also surprise me if it was, like, a deliberate choice of being like, I'm setting this rigid boundary for myself, but look how excellent I still am. <laughs> uh, I imagine Shakespeare with a bit of an ego. I really do. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, what do you think about well, all this? Well, that's a tough act to follow, Claire, because that's a much better answer than anything I was going to say. But <laughs> uh, basically, like, when I just think about the, like, few plays that are, if not entirely in verse, but really, like, emphasize it, like... I, when I think about verse, like in these plays, while so much of the plays of the time were written in verse, if not entirely, like predominantly, like I think it is still, it's the language expected of the theater, but it is still different than the common tongue that even the royals themselves would have been speaking. The actual King John was not talking to all of his political advisors in verse, and even like in the 13th century, and let alone in the Elizabethan times, we tend to think, oh, this is how the Elizabethans talk, but no, this is how plays were written. <laughs> so I think to take this play that like is this kind of like ugly chapter in history and it almost like mythologizes it in a way to put it in this like prose. It feels very much like a Homer or a Virgil. Like this is this story that feels like the most, as we were talking about before with the Magna Carta, the most consequential thing that happened in this period is absent, is completely absent from this play. <laughs> and it's just taking these like seemingly lesser moments of this otherwise forgotten King's reign and really heightening them in the way while still undercutting them by the content Mm -hmm. I also think that because it is a history play, like this might be more of like a, you know, modern day reading to apply to it, but discursively verse overtly fictionalizes, I think is important. Like when you do something in prose, it obviously won't be Shakespeare wasn't a documentary theater maker or a verbatim dramatist in any way. But when you do it in prose, it gives the sense that this might have been the thing that was actually said in this behind closed doors conversation. But when you put it in prose, it really like heightens that aspect of, of course, this is, isn't what's said. It's like the same idea of to use a more contemporary example to put like Hamilton and rap music, obviously the cabinet battles in that play wasn't Jefferson and Hamilton rapping against each other, but it conveys this idea in this heightened sense that gives us this like, ah, I understand what this conflict was like because I know what rap battles are like today. And I think verse might've been like that to the Elizabethans, but I don't know. That's all I could come up with. I didn't really have a good answer myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Will, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I, I think that Claire and Ryan, <laughs> they covered pretty much all the bases. Anything else I have now is superfluous. So, no. <laughs> Fair enough. So then we'll want you to kick us off on the next question then, which is, what does this place obsession with bastards and bastardy represent in modern culture? Uh, you know, I think this is one of the toughest uh, contextualizations of Shakespeare, like Shakespeare's canon and a lot of traditional uh, classical mm -hmm. plays that cover this idea of bastardy because like, or bastardom, uh, however you mm -hmm. want to refer to it. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, well, in the modern age, it, it's not so much of an issue. I mean, obviously <laughs> it is like a concern for family units. Like obviously mm -hmm. uh, it can be very stressful. I'm not discrediting that at all, but more so like the context of how it was taken back then versus today. Mm -hmm. If you're a bastard back then, you had no entitlements. Like you had no 
claim mm -hmm. to uh, the rights and like the properties of uh, mm -hmm. parentage, like whatever the deals may be, you have no right to it at all, regardless of mm -hmm. when you were born and who you were born to, because you are a bastard, you have mm -hmm. zero uh, claim mm -hmm. to anything, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I think that the, the challenge a lot of uh, dramatists today miss is how to take that element of, of being a bastard and apply it to the modern context. And I'm not even sure what the correct answer is myself, but I think we have to look at elements uh, of like what breaks up family units nowadays, like what are uh, certain I, like ideas of identity that can really create tension within family units that might cause somebody to be like disowned in a way mm -hmm. uh, and try to maybe contextualize uh, being a bastard in, in that way. But then, you know, we run into some political issues as well as like, are we really throwing like a lot of negative shade at like some of these identity factors uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like calling it bastardum? Like, I'm not sure what the proper answer is uh, to this question because it, it's so, uh, I, I don't know how to say it other than it's, it's very alienating for the modern audience to mm -hmm. look at being a bastard and really understand mm -hmm. and contextualize it to their own life. And, and I think Claire, you brought up a really good fact earlier, but like uh, in kind of reference to the costumes, how the costumes of that time can be alienating for the audience today. And mm -hmm. how like, when we take something from that time and place it on stage in the context of that time, sometimes it really restricts the audience's gateway into understanding the piece. Like, I think we lose a lot of sympathy for the character. Uh, like we lose a lot of sympathy for the bastard and his plight to really have a proper place in his family mm -hmm. because we just don't really relate to that nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have that. If we can contextualize it in some sort of political scope today where that element of like being disowned or losing your family because of just who you are, like I think we maybe have a, an access point, but it has to be done carefully. It has to be done uh, in, very intentionally. Um, but that, that'd be my answer to your question. I'm not sure if that fully answers the question itself. I think it's a great kickoff take on point. It. <laughs> I think it's your kickoff point. Claire, how about you? What, what, what do you say? I completely agree. I, with everything that Will just said, um, in terms of the necessity of intentionality, if you're going mm -hmm. to properly convey what bastardy was to the what was to the characters in Shakespeare's day mm -hmm. and even further back in in King John's day, if you want to make it matter today, if you want to make the resonance of that outcastness, and mm -hmm. then in the case of Philip specifically, the way that he then plays the rules of the elites to his own advantage, mm -hmm. as opposed to as opposed to setting himself in opposition to them. He plays their game for his own benefit. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to if you're going to make that matter to an audience today, I think you have to be super intentional about how you cast it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to be really intentional about how the other characters on stage treat that character. Mm -hmm. um, I think that endowing that character with special relationship to the audience is a really useful way of at least just getting us on their side so that we care mm -hmm. about their apparent struggle to be seen as fully human. Um, to me, the reason why Philip matters now is because I see Philip the Bastard in this play as like Gatsby. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see Philip as, uh, as an avatar for any one of us who's ever felt disenfranchised by the system, mm -hmm. but has thought, okay, well then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna win then. I'm not gonna, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna challenge the system. I'm not going mm -hmm. to fight against the system. I'm going to play the system by playing by its rules mm -hmm. in order to help myself, in order to mm -hmm. prop myself up in the world. Philip is, a, is such a wonderful character, but to me, a profoundly nauseating one, because to me, he could, he has the opportunity um, as someone who has been othered and rejected by, um, you know, proper lineal succession. Mm -hmm. He has the opportunity to like stick up for other disenfranchised characters and or to argue against the mm -hmm. intrinsic unfairness of a system, uh, this, this patrilineal system, right? Mm -hmm. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he goes the opposite way. And he's like, okay, well, um, I've been othered, so I'm going to make myself invaluable to them to the point mm -hmm. they can't ignore me and they have to, they have to raise me up to mm -hmm. their level. So, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, he chooses he chooses to weaponize his otherness for self-interest, mm -hmm. and it, but he doesn't he doesn't use it to help anybody else, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, and so I, I see him as a as a gap to figure. It could be mm -hmm. potentially like very alluring for for audiences, especially audiences who are not from um, like the majority, right? Like audiences mm -hmm. who are not cis, not white, not male, not you know mm -hmm. uh, privileged in some way, um, mm -hmm. but at the same time kind of repulsive because we're like oh 
you're not you're not doing anything like honorable <laughs> with your with your with your dissatisfaction with your mm -hmm. frustration with the system you're not actually mm -hmm. using it to move the world forward you're just using it to get money in your bank in your piggy in your piggy bank right so yeah so that's mm -hmm. i mean to me like the character is um presents so much opportunity and i felt like all that opportunity was left untapped by this production. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure i great 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 answer i love that ryan how about you yeah like kind of piggybacking off a lot of that but i find the mm -hmm. bastardy in this place so fascinating because it feels like it should be a bigger deal than it ultimately winds up being mm -hmm. because the entire like core conflict of this play is about succession who should be king should it be john because he is the brother of richard and that's how we're going or should it be arthur because he's jeffrey's son and jeffrey should have been king had he been alive before john or before mm. richard died and then we're introduced to philip the bastard who is richard's son and this feels like this should be a third contender in this conflict mm. that like obviously in those days in like medieval england like that would not have been the case nobody would think for a second that a bastard even a bastard of a king a fitzroy so to speak should have that uh stature but like when, when I first read this play, I was expecting him to be the villain, like, mm -hmm. unabashedly. And I think that's just from reading so many other Shakespeare plays where the bastard is the villain. When you think Richard mm -hmm. or Edmund or Don John, like, the bastards are usually the villain. And usually the bastardy is only pertinent to the plot insofar as it motivates those people to be villains. Mm -hmm. So when in, right away in Act 1, we're introduced to Philip the Bastard, who is not only a bastard, therefore Shakespeare code for evil, but also uh, he is this character who... He, like, really seems to have a claim to the throne, in a way. Like, not through the actual, like, state-sanctioned uh, monarchical structure. But mm -hmm. what I think is really interesting is right after we meet him, he has this conversation with John, and then he has this conversation with his mother. And in both cases, they substantiate his patrilineage. His mother tells him, yes, I did have an affair with Richard, therefore you are his son. Mm -hmm. And John tells him, I will accept that you are his son and I will knight ye Richard, uh, the Lionheart. Like, mm -hmm. so, and then he spends the rest of the play just being John's errand boy. <laughs> And like, he does like, that felt like such a big piece of potential that like, okay, like maybe it's just because I have Game of Thrones on the brain, but this feels like it should have been a battle of three kings who, who's going to win. And then this character who is like one of the most interesting people in the play spends most of it just being like, John's my king, I got his back because John did substantiate his patrilineage in that way. But as soon as that is substantiated, why doesn't he fight for his own claim in a way? And I think, Claire, you kind of hit the nail on the head. That's because he found a way to benefit from the system without all the headache of being king. <laughs> but I also do see him, like, especially through his commodity speech, he is power hungry. And I think mm. it surprises me that he doesn't want to take that next step as Richard the Lionheart's son. Mm -hmm. And... And this was something that, like, in, I don't know if you watched any of those, like, YouTube featurettes that Stratford accompanied this video with, like, in the in the mm -hmm. pre-show and yeah. uh, the Gopnik interview. And, like, this point kept coming up that, you know, Philip the Bastard Falconbridge, he really feels like the main character of this show. And he really, mm -hmm. you know, the idea in our head is, why isn't this guy king? And they think Shakespeare is trying to interrogate that. But with the closer I look at this play, I feel like that wasn't really on Shakespeare's mind. Like, and I think, yeah, it might just be a bit of a presentist view of history to think that, well, he's the king's son. Why isn't he a contender? That's certainly where my mind went. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think it really would have occurred to Shakespeare that this guy should have been king or like, that's just not how kings work. And there was still a monarchy at the time, even when this play was written. Mm -hmm. Will, you want to say something? <laughs> Actually, I, I wanted to hear what Claire wanted to say because I saw oh, okay. her hand go up uh, very <laughs> oh, quickly. Oh, did you? A few minutes Sorry, ago. I missed that. Go for Sorry. it. <laughs> I do have something after. Fantastic. Um, I think that there is an opportunity in the text of King John for contemporary productions mm -hmm. to really emphasize the way that the Plantagenet family tokenizes the mm -hmm. bastard, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, we're going to take you under our wing. We're going to show the whole world that, like, we have accepted you. That you are one of us, which means that we are good, generous-hearted people, right? <laughs> and, um, and we're going to endow you with just enough power and influence 
so that you are um, you move in our circles. But we're not going to give you so much that we can't hold it over your head and get you to do our dirty work for us. Mm -hmm. And me, like coming from the the American perspective here, like I just think how powerful would it be if you had like a biracial Philip, half who's like mother is black, father is this like white you know, CEO of the world. <laughs> um, and they're like, look, we're gonna, we're gonna put you out in the media. We're gonna have the whole world photograph you. Look at how we have someone who is not white, like in the, you know, in the inner sanctum of our company. And like, we're gonna, we're just gonna make sure the whole world knows that we have embraced you as one of us. And that, um, mm -hmm. and that see like, things aren't so bad for, for people who aren't white because look at this one success story mm -hmm. um, that we mm -hmm. made happen. Um, and it just feels so, like that, that scene with Eleanor where she, you know, she, she named him a Plantagenet and John does the like stupid like sword tapping thing. And it, mm -hmm. it feels, it all feels so artificial and so mm -hmm. um, emotionally manipulative. Um, and I just feel like that's, that's a really useful um, mm -hmm. contemporary illusion. Um, mm -hmm. that you could lean into and that could be really, really moving and like, like unsettling mm -hmm. for audiences. Um, but I think you have to be willing to, um, not willing, you have to be intentional mm -hmm. about, the way, about the way that you, you depict it on stage and that mm -hmm. goes that goes to the casting. Um, and I just, I felt like that political legwork was not being done here. And that's why I found this Philip so disappointing. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with the actor per se. Mm -hmm. I just, I didn't care about his struggle because I didn't perceive any. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair, yeah. Will, what, what are your thoughts? Um, honestly, I actually, I think Claire just kind of addressed those exact thoughts that <laughs> yeah. I was having. I was also thinking of some of the other representations of bastards within other plays. Like the one that jumps to my mind always is Edmund from King Lear. Um, mm -hmm. and, and how we staged that in, in frustrations because like there is a bastard that struggles there is a bastard who has something that he's willing to fight for literally in the first act of the play is like i defy you stars i defy the role that you have set forth as a bastard right mm -hmm. like that powerful that's the struggle and that's what i was about to say about this this bastard in this play he goes i'm a bastard and i want things and everyone goes oh, okay <laughs> well, like just kind something of that i will add on to that yeah, quickly like historically speaking the like the reason why bastardy and illegitimacy was baked into so many like legal and political institutions was quite literally because it was expected that men would philander. There's nothing you could do about mm -hmm. it. It's their Darwinistic need to spread their seed. And therefore it was to protect, yes, to use a crude term, but that's like, that was basically the idea of what men would be doing at the time. And, uh, uh, and the idea was to protect the like natural born children to their inheritance. And that was why bastardy is something that was baked into the institutions of these time. Like mm -hmm. a, an example that I think is like really interesting is like, if you don't have any, like, natural-born children, do you, like, what happens to all your wealth and your title? It Could it go to one of your bastard children? I think, like, in War and Peace, like, Count Bezukov, you know, he's dying, he doesn't have any natural-born children, so what he does is he writes a letter to the Tsar and said, make Pierre my legitimate son, I bequeath it. And that's just like, mm -hmm. okay, he, the Tsar can just do that, and I think that's very similar to what we see mm -hmm. John and knighting him as Richard here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's just what an interesting concept bastard is and how it's like shaped so much of history like mm -hmm. things could have been so different otherwise but i don't know i don't think i really yeah. answered the question on what to do with it modern wise but i think mm -hmm. you two did enough of that that i'm happy yeah. to just leave my thoughts there mm -hmm. i mean uh, i mean yeah i mean you've all kind of wonderfully illustrated i mean the one thing i had in my notes in particular about the modernization of this bastards and bastardy thing is how we've almost reclaimed that concept and made it into a positive thing like nowadays in in, in, in media like you have Jon Snow the bastard mm -hmm. and he's now become this heroic figure of the story or it's the whole concept of somebody of the, the other of the system coming in and being a good leader that we see or, or somebody running on that concept I mean Trump ran you know he's a, not a good leader sorry uh, but like he ran on the whole concept of I am the other, I am the outside person of the political system, and I'm going to come in and shake things up and be a person of the people. So for bastards, for bastard and bastard, I think that's where this, where we've taken this modern thing. I think that's where Philip could have gone. I don't think they went with that this version, 
thought you could go that direction with that. I don't know. Will, your, your I, wheels are spinning. That I that's see. a bit of a troubling stance to someone going to use. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a bit of a troubling stance just in some of the examples you gave. For instance, like John yeah. Snow representing bastardy in the modern age and like how we take that, but he ends up not being a bastard. And like, yeah. that's why he is so uh, well redeemed as like a good king, good ruler. Cause it's like, oh, he's not a bastard. You know, like they take that contextualization. Yeah. Uh, and it's more Therefore, like the Lords of Westeros will like him because he's also he, not a woman. And, and we took that from Jon Snow and he ended up being a bastard whole piece and then was chosen. I mean, we're using Game of Thrones and I apologize. That, but, uh, and then was chosen despite the lineage or like the, mm -hmm. in, in light of the struggle, in light of the things he's learned and been through because of this element of him, then maybe that would be a more valid example in my mind. But like, it's just such a, a shift in the entire story when it's just like, oh, he's not a bastard. Oh, okay. So like, he's okay. You know, like <laughs> it's dismissed in a way uh, that yeah. really bothers me. Mind you, his Mark Rabbit Hole, John Snow's Bastard D doesn't get uh, uh, revealed to him until the final season. So throughout 99% of the story, John is considered the bastard. He's until considered the bastard, but then when we find out that he actually is the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, it's like, oh, of course he was such a good leader because he's of royal blood. It doesn't make, well, it's not get on any more Game of Thrones. Yeah. I know this is, but it, it's still, it's like, it's a cheat because they, it they says use it as a justification to his character. Yeah, why yeah. he's such a good leader. <laughs> sure, anyway. either way. Yeah. All right, final question. Claire, I want you to lead this one off. Why is King John one of the least performed history plays? And after seeing this recording, should it be performed more often? Well, I think it's one of the least performed because it's political satire, which is hard enough to stage on its own in a way that's going to, you know, land for audiences. Um, because of course the challenge with satire is you want to be pointed enough that your, that your message comes across, but you don't want to be so on the nose that the audience feels like you're preaching. So it's a really, it's a tough, that is a tough balancing act to, to pull off as a theater production. So this, this show invites you to, to do a political satire, but it wraps it all up in unfamiliar Shakespearean verse. Mm -hmm. Um, and Shakespearean verse, even for those of us who love Shakespeare, can be really, really hard to, to understand in the moment. It can be hard to access. Um, and with the language of King John, John in particular, this isn't text that we're like universally culturally familiar with. This isn't like the text of Hamlet where we, even if we don't know exactly what they mean, we know kind of what's going on because we, we've mm -hmm. received the mythos of the story and the language of the culture. Mm -hmm. King John doesn't have that kind of prestige or reputation. So everything mm -hmm. that we hear when the characters talk is pretty unfamiliar. Um, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's verse and it's, you know, uh, an older form of speaking in English. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I think thirdly for, at least for people on this continent, this isn't our, um, this isn't our history, mm -hmm. right? Don't, we don't learn about this stuff, about who these people were and how they all were related mm -hmm. to each other with the kind of um, depth and complexity that you probably would receive if you were a school child mm -hmm. living in the UK. So mm -hmm. um, it's also like, it's, it's almost triply alienating because so many of these figures, their names and actions are, are um, not immediately recognizable to us. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not a part of our historical uh, uh, paradigm. And so I think you, you add all those elements together and it just makes for a really hard sell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to do, but I think it's also hard to sell to audiences. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is the potential for this play to be so politically resonant today. Mm -hmm. But I think you have, to, you have to perform it and produce it in a way that highlights the systemic othering of the characters mm -hmm. who do not have privilege and power. And I'm thinking about Philip the Bastard and I'm thinking about the women, particularly Constance and Blanche, um, I mean, I see Eleanor, for instance, as like the epitome of white feminism, right? Mm -hmm. Eleanor to me should be played by an old white woman. That is <laughs> because she is not, she is not the queen, but by mm -hmm. weaponizing the privilege that she has been born into, she has found a way to hold on to it and even mm -hmm. to, and even to use it through her son, who is like her puppet in many ways. Um, but she doesn't use her power to do anything ostensibly progressive or just for the kingdom. She just does it for her own, you know, sort of political power game. Um, and then you have a character like like the bastard and we've talked a lot about him, so I don't want to harp on it. Um, but with, with intentional casting, that role could potentially be like revolutionary to watch on stage. And then a character like Constance, like she is, she is 
not listened to. She is like routinely ignored and shut mm -hmm. out of the decisions and the, um, the the important choices that are made in this in this show. Um, she is she is shut out. Her perspective is dismissed. Um, she is treated and considered a hysterical woman. And mm -hmm. imagine how much more powerful her struggle and her grief would be if she's played by a woman of color, right? Mm -hmm. Like imagine how much more poignant those speeches would be if it, if it was being spoken by the voice, in the voice and body of um, a person that we can just see has had a totally different experience of, of life than the rest of us, who has had no, who has not had the, um, uh, has not been listened to, has not had the, the grace mm -hmm. of white men's time, who has mm -hmm. been told to you know, sit down and sit up. Like, I just, I think that this, this story can, it has the potential as a narrative to mm -hmm. like strike at the core of some of our biggest um, political injustices today. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we have to cast it intentionally, I think we have to stage it intentionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect, well said. Uh, Ryan, what are, you, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so like this is a bit of a two-part question. It's the why is it one of the less famous ones, and does do we see potential for it? Um, I think something that comes to my mind about why this is often like disregarded or not thought of as one of the like more prominent Shakespeare history plays is that it's really like isolated, like historically, like in the story it tells, because we tend to think of Shakespeare's history plays in cycles. And like we, yeah, like we get to see Hal grow up in Henry IV, and then we see him on the battlefield in Henry V, and we understand this progression. And, but we don't have the Henry the Third play. Like when he shows up at the end, Prince Henry shows up at the end of this, it's like, who is this guy? What's his story? <laughs> and like suddenly Shakespeare's version of history ends, and we have a long gap until we eventually get to Richard II. And, and I think, yeah, like the, the only other history play that comes to my mind I, uh, is the Henry VIII is the only one that we also don't have what bookends it, but that is also one, it's also one of the outlier plays, partly because it's co-authored by Fletcher, but the other part of that is Henry VIII is such this like larger than life figure in world history that people can gravitate towards that story because, you know, it's Henry VIII, like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think this little episode of history feels cut off from the rest. And there's so often we see like the history plays are produced in cycles and you'll do like a combined version of just the Henry ad. And so to just like take King John, it's like, we're once again, to bring it back to the Magna Carta, we're not even talking about what was very important in this moment in history that like, yeah, it doesn't really feel that important. It's just this one king's rise and fall, essentially, mm -hmm. even though it did obviously have huge ramifications in English history, in the Shakespeare scope of things, it feels like the easy one to forget. Uh, in terms of did this production make me feel like uh, it should be done more often? I would say yes, insofar as we talked about this a lot earlier, but there was a lot of potential in this production that maybe didn't like it didn't live up to in the whole thing. So I can definitely see like things to do with this different ways of producing it that like some that would like lean much harder into the comedy and others that would lean much harder into the seriousness of it. Um, but the one thing that I really like stuck out to me, especially watching it now is that there's something really honest in this story about conflict and wars and the escalation thereof, because the moment that really stuck stands out to me is that uh, the whole conflict starts because of John's disagreement with the papacy and everyone has to choose sides and that breaks up the union between Blanche and the Dauphin. And then when in at the beginning of Act 5, when John restores his ties with Rome and then the Cardinal tries to like reason with the Dauphin for we can call it all off because the thing that started this conflict has been resolved. By that point, Arthur's dead, and the Dauphin says, I wrote down this quote because I think it's just like so important to what this play is about, come ye now and tell me that John has made his peace with Rome? What is that peace to me? And mm -hmm. it just goes to show that even if the thing that started this conflict has been resolved, conflicts escalate beyond control, and once you start engaging in this battle that there's really there's no containing it even if you can extinguish the thing that started it and i think mm -hmm. that is something that is worth coming back to and really seeing and i think this play does handle that very elegantly and i would like to see more productions really like play with the conflict in this piece mm -hmm. yeah perfect well as our our uh, artistic director here at cup of hemlock 
what are your thoughts? <laughs> like, 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 could we see this down the road? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, it's play. it's a bit of a loaded question. First of all, is that if, mm-hmm. if Cup of Hemlock were to ever do it, I, it would have to lead into a lot of what Claire and I have been talking about, about like the intentionality of casting, mm-hmm. the intentionality of, <laughs> of like what we are choosing to put onto the stage in terms of mm-hmm. representation and, and what political scope and lens that applies to the piece. That is the only time that like I really would feel comfortable with Cup of Hemlock performing a piece like this. Mm-hmm. Um, the... And then I'm going to go on the, the flip end of it because uh, mm-hmm. first of all, like speaking off of what Ryan just said is I feel that all of the history plays culminatively kind of capture what you were just talking about, Ryan, like the, mm-hmm. the subtleties of what leads to war, what leads to mm-hmm. conflict, how conflict is sustained, why it is sustained. Uh, like I think that if you look at the scope of all the history plays, we see that more clearly than just with King John. I think King John is an independent piece, does capture that quite well. Um, I just feel that the history is as a whole is is that representation the problem that i actually have and it's something that we haven't really talked about with king john because it is satire and it, it gives us the ability to laugh at english history um mm-hmm. the okay so first of all the reason that i think it's the least performed is because in the scope of the other history plays the same elements that are in king john are captured in the other plays and the other plays i just feel have more pull for an audience and, mm-hmm. and at the end of the day history speaks for itself if king john isn't mm-hmm. performed as much now and it hasn't been performed as much as since when it was written it's probably because there are other plays that better represent what king john has to say and i think that's mm-hmm. the gist of it um the other side of this though is that um after seeing this recording should it be performed more yes but with intentionality on the other side yeah. of the scope is that uh, the history plays are quite dense to begin with they're they're a bit of a slog mm-hmm. if you don't capture some of those more nuanced elements it can mm-hmm. feel more like a lecture than uh, performance <laughs> um but the bigger issue actually that i find and i do find this with all of the history plays in general mm-hmm. is is there's this glorification of english history that happens where like even in the concept of like laughing at at war like we, we're laughing at violence we're laughing at oppression we're laughing at all of the horrid elements that come along with battle that come along with mm-hmm. victory quote unquote um and I, I think it's something that's very overlooked when we look at the history plays but at the end of the day is like i think king john maybe captures it a little bit in a more uh, positive light because of people looking back on their history and being able to i guess laugh in, in this case in this staging mm-hmm. as to some of the lunacy that went on but i think that the histories can often dismiss the atrocities of english history during that time and <laughs> And we create a very dangerous precedent if we continue to promote mm-hmm. plays that act on that element. Um, the, yeah, so um, should it be performed more often? Uh, I, I think only if we are aware of what this play is trying to say and, and how we contextualize it for the modern mm-hmm. age. Otherwise, all we're doing again is, is glorifying more of the same that has been glorified in the past. Mm-hmm. And like we, like you mentioned, Ryan, is like uh, some of the history plays are already propagandic. Like it's very intentionally <laughs> mm-hmm. like glorification mm-hmm. of English history, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but you know, what are we doing? Like what responsibility do we have as modern dramatists to the text as well as to our society? Like we have to be more careful about what we stage and, and what we are mm-hmm. putting on the stage. Uh, I think if mm-hmm. we keep that in mind as we move forward, we're going to be okay but if we don't we're damaging more than building mm-hmm. well said. wonderful wonderful i mean and then i'll and i'll, and I'll wrap it up because like my thoughts are I, I think the reason why king john isn't done more often is because it's hard to produce i mean all the other history plays people know like people know about richard the third henry the fifth henry the eighth here king john like guys ryan pointed out the one big thing he's remembered for is not done at all in this play so it's like <laughs> trying to bring an audience in to be like, let's go watch a history play when a lot of people don't like history to begin with. Like now it's like, how, just, just like, how do you market and produce it? So that's why I don't think it's done that often. I think after seeing this, I do agree. There's a lot of opportunity here to really kind of examine this play and reach it. I mean, I love Dean H. Molino's idea where, where he said like, yeah, I think he, he mentioned in one of the features where he's like, I would love to see King, like King John done, done with almost like a Richard Nixon type i'm sure it's been done <laughs> i'm sure it's being done too but I, 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 after that my wheels just starts being going you could do that or, 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 or i feel like does back enough probably would have done it but <laughs> probably but actually yeah but yeah the last time this was done it, it, it actually was directed by angie chimino with Stephen olmet as, as as king john um either way uh but yeah i mean i mean i mean his idea though gave me a lot of interesting ways where you could take this play i got like you could do it set anytime during world war one I, I think is another great kind of setting you kind of could put this play where it's the whole concept of war and and, and and the triviality of what goes on here or even as i think i think it was either will or claire you pointed out that like trump is a very similar figure to king john in his presidency so you definitely could do a 
uh, a, a production like that, just kind of like what they did with that Trump Caesar production that, well, didn't, uh, once again, I, I, well, just like as people pointed out, if people hadn't left in protest after the assassination, they would have seen what they actually talk about with Caesar with Mark Antony, where it kind of defeated the point of what they were, I think they were trying to say. Uh, either way, but yeah, I do think there's a lot of potential with this particular play because it hasn't been done often since the Victorian, because that was the last time it was really popular, was in the Victorian period, and then it kind of has fallen off the map. So I think there's a lot of great interpretations that could be done since it's not produced often. You just have to have the right producer to know how to market it to an audience to make them want to come and sit through this history play. But other than that, are there any other last thoughts that we have before we say adieu for, for the week? Uh, just that I would love to see Claire's production of King John with Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that'd be great. Claire, let us know when you're going to do that. We'll happily we'll come, fly down and watch it. When we're allowed to fly again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. for sure. Wonderful. Okay, well, that is it for this episode, everybody. Claire, where can people find you if they want to uh, follow up with you after watching this and kind of converse with you further? On oh social gosh. media. <laughs> I'm so bad at social media. I mean... <laughs> I guess you could try to find me on Facebook. I, I think it's like, it's like, I'm like 357. I'm like the 357th Claire Martin or something. But Do you I want strangers get... sending you friend requests though? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> honestly, if you, if you want to talk to me about Shakespeare, if you want to talk to me about what I do, um, mm. uh, then actually email me. That's the best way. Um, okay. I'm so bored at school, but um, C Martin. C M A R T I N at sweetpeashakespeare.com, S W E E T T E A Shakespeare.com. Steve Martin at uh, sweetpeashakespeare.com. Send me an email. I would love to talk with you about Shakespeare anytime. Perfect. Wonderful. Will, where can people find you? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned on the last one I was a part of that I finally got an Instagram and a Twitter uh, for the life of me. This is how frequent I am on it. I, I can't remember either of the handles, and I should have remembered this we'll question. We'll put them in the descriptions. Uh, it's fine. Perfect, yes. We have it from true. last time. We'll just copy um, and paste it. <laughs> similar to Claire, uh, if, if you want to chat with me or uh, inform me of some things, because I'm sure that I missed uh, a lot of information and some of my facts are, are probably off mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but I, I love talking Shakespeare. Anybody who knows me knows that. Uh, you can hit me up at uh, William period Bartley. 12 at gmail.com. I'd love to just have a Skype call, Zoom call, or mm -hmm. maybe if you're around the area after COVID breaks, a cup of coffee and talk about mm -hmm. things. So <laughs> love that'd that. be the easiest way to reach me is over email. Mm -hmm. And Ryan, give us your regular message. Well, it's so nice to be surrounded by fellow non-social media people, because um, every every episode I sign off with, you can't find me, so just send that love to Cup of Hemlock instead. Um, but I guess if we're doing emails, you can find me at ryan.barakovich, it's hard to spell, it'll be in the description, at mail.utoronto.ca, that's my school email, you can message me there if you want to talk about Shakespeare, don't message me there just to... Just to be weird, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, you can find me on all those media platforms at Mackenzie Horner. Also, uh, check out uh, my podcast, Before the Downbeat, a musical podcast, where I talk musicals on a weekly basis. Uh, when this comes out, we will be releasing our uh, review or our discussion about 1776, the musical all about the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the Hamilton before Hamilton. We get all into that good stuff. So be sure to give that a check out as well. But until next time, uh, we will see you next week where we'll, be, where we'll be discussing another of the Shakespeare kind of lesser done plays, which is Pericles. Yeah. And we have a very special guest returning for that episode. I wonder who until, that could be. <laughs> I know, right? Who could it be? Who could it be? But be sure to tune in for that. Either way, have a great time, everybody. We'll see you all next week. Have a great, great week, everybody. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>